2009 International Conference on Liquid Crystal Elastomers. It's intended for a general audience and as an introduction to the interesting science and applications that come out of combining liquid crystals and rubber. The lecture will be given by Jonathan Selinger, who is a professor of chemical physics and Ohio eminent scholar here at Penn State. And uh, Jonathan will take uh, about 10 minutes of questions after the uh, talk today. So uh, I'd like to bring him on and um, the title of the Crystal Rubber is providing for new technology. Thank you so much, Sam. Can you all hear me with the, uh, the mic here? Great, thanks. Um, so as Sam mentioned, there's a uh, major uh, international conference on liquid crystal and elastomers that is taking place uh, at Penn State um, um, over the past uh, three days. Um, and uh, so scientists from around the world uh, have been coming to discuss this field uh, at a series of uh, meetings. Um, and as part of this conference, um, we decided to organize a public lecture to uh, introduce uh, um, undergraduates, any members of the general public, uh, to the fields that we're working on now. So that's what I'm delighted to be uh, presenting here to all of you. Um, I do recognize that there are many uh, participants from the conference here in the audience. And before we get started, I just want to emphasize um, I'm, I'm happy to see you here, but this talk is not for you, okay? <laughs> so, just to be very clear on this, um, um, this is, is meant to be a talk for the general public, and so if that is not what you're looking for, uh, you may wish to decline at this time, as the pilot says at the beginning of a flight, right? So, this is meant to be for the general public, and for the public, I want to introduce this field of combining uh, liquid crystals and rubber uh, to see what you get, uh, uh, to see how we can take fundamental scientific con uh, concepts and use them to, uh, to manipulate uh, materials uh, as this international group of researchers has been doing. So the plan of the talk is what I'm going to show up here. Uh, I want to begin with uh, general principles, the introducing the concepts of order and disorder, energy versus entropy, um, and then gradually take you around a circle about how we would use these concepts to understand existing materials and design new materials, uh, beginning with polymers, uh, around to rubber and elastomers, uh, then liquid crystals, uh, and finally uh, winding up where, uh, where the focus of this conference is on the liquid crystalline uh, elastomers. Um, but the emphasis here is really going to be on the fundamental science uh, as opposed to the technological applications, although I will be touching on the uh, applications as well. <coughs> so beginning with um, general principles. Uh, the way physicists think about materials is generally um, looking for the big ideas, right? Capital B, capital I. Right? The, the ideas that are fundamentally simple in concept, but can be applied to understand many things. And uh, you can take the same concept and apply it to astronomy or to nuclear reactors, or here in this case to liquid crystalline elastomers. Um, and so uh, that's the kind of, of uh, ideology that I want to try to present to get across in this talk. Um, and it's a view of the world uh, that I think was really nicely expressed in a, in a poem by uh, William Blake that I want to quote here. Um, he begins, to see the world in a grain of sand and heaven in a wild flower, to hold infinity in the palm of your hands and eternity in an hour, right? To take to take uh, what you can see in a microscopic bit of sand and expand it to encompass uh, so much of the world, to get a unified vision of the whole world. So, inspired by Blake, let's start with a grain of sand, or perhaps a speck of dust. Okay, so I'm going to make up a very simple physics problem, almost a joke problem, uh, and see what are the general lessons we can learn from that and then apply to more complicated problems. Okay, so we think of a particle of dust, and let's suppose that it can be in two different places. 
to imagine it could be on the floor or it could be up on a table, right? And the wind is blowing it around uh, and so it uh, experiences thermal fluctuations coming from its environment. Um, and so we want to see how much of the time it will be down on the floor, how much of the time it will be up on the table. Okay, this is a joke problem, of course. This is not the real physics of dust, okay? But I'm just making this up. All right, so um, let's, uh, let's think about that. So there's a different energy depending on whether it's on the floor or it's on the table, right? It's a lower energy if it's on the floor. Gravity is pulling it down to the floor. Higher energy on the table. Um, if it were in thermal equilibrium, okay, then the laws of thermodynamics would tell us that there's a probability of finding it on the floor or on the table, which is an exponential, okay? It is uh, the exponential function of the energy divided by temperature and divided by a universal constant, Boltzmann's constant, okay? So uh, this is about the most mathematics I'm going to show in this whole lecture, right? But the idea to get across here is that if the energy is small, then this is the exponential of a negative small number, so it's something pretty big, a reasonable probability. If the energy is high up on the table, then this energy is really big, and this is the exponential of a big negative number, so really small, right? So of course, the particle is more likely to be found in its lowest energy state. Okay, but now, let's make it a little more complicated. Let's suppose there are many tables, okay? Not just one, but I'll make some enormous number of them, okay? And so now we imagine the particle could be on the floor or it could be on any of these tables, right? There are many, many high energy states. And let's do our probability calculation once again, okay? So again, there's an energy to have it on the floor, right? And there's an energy to have it on a table, still the same, but now there are a lot of tables. Let's say they're capital N tables, okay? So there are many high energy states. So we can ask, what's the probability of finding it on any one of these? Well, that is the product of a very small number, this exponential, with a very big number, the number of places where it could be, right? So if you take a small number times a big number, well, it might be big or it might be small, right? It depends. Um, so let's compare which is more likely to find it on the floor or to find it up in one of these high energy states. Okay, well, to do that, we want to compare these two numbers. Um, or equivalently, if we want to make this comparison, we can take the logarithm of both sides. If anyone doesn't remember a logarithm from high school math, that is the, the opposite of an exponential, right? Comparing what's up in the exponential on each side. So we're comparing the energy on the floor with the energy on the table with this extra correction that comes from the factor of the number of states up in the front, okay? So here, this is showing us something kind of interesting, right? It's showing us that what's more likely doesn't just depend on energy, but there's this extra term involving the multiplicity of states. So we have different considerations, energy versus this number of states, uh, uh, the logarithm of the number of states, something that's termed entropy, right? So entropy is a measure of the disorder of the system, the number of possible states that are the high energy states that the particle could be in. And depending on how big this is, well, either one of these things might win. Either one of these things might be more important. And what controls which is more important is this factor of temperature right in front, right? If the temperature is zero, the entropy doesn't matter at all. Only the energy matters. But if you're at a non-zero temperature, if you're at a high temperature, then the entropy is more important, and the particle will seek out the uh, uh, states that have more possibilities. It wants to go to the range of high energy states, and it doesn't care so much about the energy. It wants the large number, okay? So this combination of energy and entropy 
is what um, scientists term the free energy uh, of, the, uh, of the state. So summarizing here, when we're at low temperature, we have energy is more important, uh, which favors a single state. And because there's a single particular state, it's something that we would characterize as order. We would know specifically what the particle is doing. If we're at high temperature, then entropy is more important, favoring multiple states, um, leading to a disordered range of possible configurations. Okay, so this was my sort of joke problem. Uh, let's now uh, apply it to something else uh, a little more realistic, like thinking about what's the volume of air. So air is a gas, but right? there are a few molecules floating around, but it's a very low density of molecules uh, in the air. Um, so they interact with each other a little bit, but not very much. They don't get very close to each other to interact very much. So to a first approximation, we could say the energy doesn't matter much. It's just the entropy that matters. Okay? So let me try to trick you. Uh, let's say, let's suppose that we say the energy doesn't matter, so it doesn't matter if the air is in a big volume or a little volume, right? It's the same energy either way, right? So it shouldn't matter. So let me, I will do an experiment, all right? So I take a sample of air. This is the kind of experiment that I do as a theoretical physicist, <laughs> right? Okay, so I've got a sample of air. And so I, I, I collect it here. And so if we think that the energy doesn't matter, right? So it doesn't matter if I try to change the volume, right? But, but it doesn't work, right? I can't change the volume, right? So why not? Well, it has to be that the entropy is what's dominating here, right? That when there's a large volume, there are a lot of places where the molecules can go. Um, and so a high entropy, and they like that, right? When there's a smaller volume, there aren't so many places where these molecules can go. A low entropy, they don't like that. And so if I try to push against it, um, it pushes back on me, right? And so it gives the, uh, the resistance to compression, right? And so it's a real physical force. You know, I can feel it, it's me in the head. Um, so I guess that's the, uh, the, the, the lesson of this uh, illustration, right? It's entropy is real, right? It's not just some counting game that I made up before, but it's a, a real physical force that can hit me in the head. Um, so um, that's you know, a, a standard example from, uh, from high school chemistry there. Think about what's the, uh, what's the uh, volume taken up by a gas. But now let's get to something a little more complicated, okay? Let's think about polymers. And we can do that in some idealized way by imagining that our units, any arbitrary units, uh, are connected together, okay? So these are some molecular units which are bonded together by chemical bonds. Um, for one specific example, here's the structure of uh, polyethylene, okay? So we have uh, 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 carbon and hydrogen units that are connected by chemical bonds. But for my purposes, it doesn't matter so much what the chemical units are, right? These could be any kind of units that are all connected together, and so they form some kind of line. Um, and the question for us will be, what's the overall shape? of this uh, polymer, right? And so there are different possibilities, right? It could be straight like this, or it could be bent in some very disordered configuration. Okay? This is a disordered configuration uh, that scientists typically refer to as a random walk, right? because we imagine this is a path where you might be walking along here, right? And if you, uh, you, know, you don't look where you're going, you take a step here, a step here, a step there, right? It could be some very disordered path that you're walking along. And so this could be the configuration of a polymer in space. And let's compare these different kinds of states, right? If it's straight, well, it's straight in one direction. So as you go along, 
right? There's only one place where you can put the successive units. Hence, a very low number of states, a low entropy. By comparison, if it's a random walk, there are many possible states. There are many possible ways of arranging the chemical units that all look equivalent to each other. So the many possible states gives a high entropy, which the polymer likes. And as the temperature gets higher and higher, it likes it more and more. So uh, that was a picture with uh, just a few units. Uh, here's an uh, illustration with some thousands of units showing a typical configuration of a random walk, a very disordered polymer. Um, and what people can show, based on the statistics of random walks, is that there's an average end-to-end -end distance, which scales just as the square root of the number of units, right? unlike a straight line, where the end-to-end -end distance would scale proportional to the number of units to the first power. Right? So if I took this random walk and straightened it out, um, you know, it would go from here to Akron. Um, but uh, here in this disordered configuration, um, it, uh, it takes up much less space. The two ends are pretty close to each other. Um, and we could ask, well, where's the most likely location for the end point? And that's just around by the beginning point, right? The end point is equally likely to go off in any direction, but it's not going to get very far from the beginning point. And in fact, I could grab one end of this polymer, right, try to pull it. And it would pull back on me like a spring, even though there's no actual energy involved, right? I've told you a story which is just about entropy, a story that involves uh, the number of accessible states, but still, entropy is real. And as I pull on the polymer, it doesn't have as many states available to it, right? If I make the end-to-end -end distance bigger than what it wants, there aren't so many states available, uh, so it will pull back. And this is the kind of experiment that people can actually do in the lab now. There are um, um, instruments with nanotechnology that can indeed grab the end of a polymer and pull it and measure the force and it does indeed act like a spring. And it's a spring that's just being uh, controlled by entropy. Um, and uh, so the, the stiffness of the spring is something that comes out of the temperature. Let's make things a little more complicated now. Okay, so suppose we have uh, a lot of, um, of uh, polymers all mixed up together, right? So here's one, Here's another one, uh, and we start cross-linking them. Right? So we put in some chemical bonds like this um, so that the polymers aren't free just to slide against each other, uh, but instead uh, they are linked together. So there's still random walks in between the cross-links, but the cross-links are stuck. Right? They are not going to move around. Um, the idea then, well, I can tell you the theory and the practice, okay? So this is what, what's called a rubber or an elastomer. Uh, a, that is a network of crosslinks that are uh, permanently connected together. The crosslinks are covalently bonding these uh, 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 polymer chains. Um, so they have energy and entropy that are both involved. Okay. The energy is just a sort of simple energy that comes from the individual units repelling each other. Right? The individual units take up space, so the whole thing can't just collapse on itself and make a black hole. Uh, it requires some space, right? so there's some fixed uh, volume. Um, but that's about the only way that energy is important. Entropy, though, is really crucial for the uh, uh, elastomer structure, right? because there's now a random walk, so one of these entropic springs, uh, between each 
pair of neighboring cross legs. Right? So the cross legs uh, are some distance apart. Right? They can't really get much closer because the uh, uh, individual units are taking up space. Right? So there's a limit on how much you can compress it. But if you try to pull on it, well, that's the same as when I was pulling on this giant polymer, and it pulls back. Right? So, I forgot to bring my visual aid for that, but I think you've all seen rubber bands before. Right? When you pull on them, right, they do indeed pull back on you, and that is just entropy pulling back on you. That is the polymer that wants to have a lot of states available to it, and it doesn't like it if you have the cross links farther apart so that there aren't as many states available. So it gives uh, an entropic spring that you've all felt with your bare hands, just pulling on a rubber band. Um, and uh, so that's the, the whole idea of why elastomers are stretchy. Right? The random walk provides a lot of molecular units that can extend. Right? If we want to pull these things apart, there's room to pull them apart. There is extra space in these chains that can be pulled apart but it doesn't want to be pulled apart, and so it costs energy, hence the, the stretchiness of a rubber band. In practice, well, natural rubber is something produced by trees. Uh, synthetic rubber is uh, one of the great technological achievements of the 20th century, uh, something that um, you know, was needed to uh, build tires when uh, uh, the, uh, the United States lost access to rubber trees during World War II. Um, and indeed, that's what uh, built the city of Akron, right? And that's the, the key for, um, for building tires for the, the technological uh, uh, industry of the 20th century. Um, still, the, the, basics, uh, the basis of much of the, the plastics industry. Um, it's making materials that are stretchy, that have mechanical properties that can be controlled depending on how you process them. They can be stiffer or less stiff. Um, and so, uh, you know, people of my generation uh, grew up with this movie of, uh, of The Graduate, right? Where the, the key for, uh, for Dustin Hoffman out of college uh, was, uh, you know, he got the advice, go into plastics, right? And so, um, we can see, based on this technology, that's really what he should have done and just forgotten about Mrs. Robinson. Um, so, um, you know, this is a, a story about elastomers, a story about the, uh, the mechanics of uh, what's going on uh, inside of these materials. Um, let's now see how we can generalize this story to apply to liquid crystals, okay? So it's a separate uh, uh, story, a separate area of science and technology, but one that's governed by a lot of the same principles. So here, to understand liquid crystals, we want to suppose that our units are not round, but are roughly elongated, like this. Okay? So, and this is my idealization of an elongated molecule. Um, Real chemists have real molecules that they use uh, in its place. Um, here's one example, here's another example. So these are molecules that form liquid crystals. Uh, these things typically have a stiff section and a floppy section. Um, but uh, again, for, for the purposes of this lecture, uh, let's neglect those chemical uh, aspects and just think about elongated objects. And what we can ask then is if they're elongated, they must be pointing in some direction, right? So which direction are they pointing? And if we have a lot of them, are they all pointing in the same direction or in a lot of different directions? So we can illustrate both of these possibilities here, right? Here we can uh, have a, a, a structure where there are many different molecules and they're all pointing in different directions, as opposed to an alternative possibility where they're all pointing in more or less the same direction. Not exactly, but there's some special direction 
that's been singled out. Okay? This is called an isotropic state, meaning that it's the same in all directions, right? Iso is for equal and tropic is for directions, right? And this one is called a nomadic state for reasons that I don't want to go into here. Uh, but uh, a, a state where the molecules are on average pointing in the same direction. So, we can again do our comparison of energy and entropy for these different possible states. Right? For the isotropic state, the molecules are all pointing in different directions. Well, there are lots of ways that you can arrange molecules that are all pointing in different directions. Right? It's easy to draw something like this. I can just randomly put molecules down um, in pretty much any arrangement and they'll be pointing all over the place. So this has a very high entropy. Um, by comparison, the nomadic state has a lot fewer possible states. There aren't so many ways that you can arrange the molecules all pointing in a consistent way. Hence, a low entropy, right? So high entropy is good, low entropy is bad, right? So, why doesn't it always make an isotropic state? Well, we have to think about the energy involved also. Right? In the nomadic state, the molecules are packed pretty efficiently. They can have the kinds of interactions that they like. They can be about the right spacing apart from each other. Uh, it's uh, energetically a very favorable kind of arrangement. <coughs> By comparison, in the isotropic state, that is not the case. Right here you can see some parts of the molecules are really close together, other parts are really far apart. Um, and so they don't get the kind of configuration that they would like, hence a much higher energy. So, now, there are conflicting goals here, right? Energy is saying, let's make a nomadic phase. Entropy is saying, let's make an isotropic phase. So there has to be a balance between those. And as I illustrated at the beginning of the lecture, that's a balance that's controlled by temperature, right? So you will get a phase transition between these two possible states. Um, the nomadic state occurring at low temperature and the isotropic state occurring at high temperature. And in this case, it's not a smooth crossover the way in the case of polymers, as you change the temperature, you gradually change from one, one state to another one. Here, it's actually an abrupt phase transition that takes place at a specific temperature, the same way that water uh, melts from ice to liquid at 32 Fahrenheit, or boils from liquid to gas at 212 Fahrenheit, um, the isotropic to pneumatic transition occurs at a specific temperature, which temperature depends on which particular molecules the chemist has synthesized, but a single particular temperature that can be around room temperature, can be above room temperature, right? So that you could have a nomadic phase like this at room temperature, which then melts into an isotropic uh, if we put the sample into an oven. So this is the uh, possibility of a nomadic phase, uh, which is the <laughs> simplest and most common liquid crystal phase. There are other liquid crystal phases also, but I don't want to go into them here. So, why are the liquid crystals useful? Um, what's the, the technological significance of having this kind of effect? Well, I guess um, there are really two points that go into why they're useful. Right? One is that it's easy to reorient the molecules. It's easy to push them around because they have only picked a particular direction to point in because of this delicate balance between energy and entropy. And if you try to push them to some other direction, you know, it's not too hard, all right? So you push them around with electric fields, magnetic fields, uh, surface treatments on the edge of 
uh, the cell that they're in uh, with chemical stimuli, uh, with ultraviolet light, if you've uh, put some dye into the liquid crystal. Right? And these things can all change which way the molecules are pointing. Um, so in this respect, liquid crystals are like liquids, right, where it's really easy to push the molecules around also, right, and unlike crystals, where it's much harder to push the molecules around. Uh, however, the other special feature of liquid crystals is that when we change the orientation of the molecules, change which way they're pointing, it really matters, right? In a typical liquid, it's easy to push the molecules around, but it doesn't much matter, right? If you have liquid water and water flows here or there, it doesn't matter so much for how the glass of water looks. But with the liquid crystal, when we push the molecules around, when we change their orientation, we change the way that the molecules interact with light. Right? In particular, <coughs> we have polarized light shining through a liquid crystal sample. Um, it interacts differently depending on whether the direction of polarization uh, is along the long part of the molecules, like this, uh, or perpendicular to that. And that's really the key to liquid crystal technology. So here uh, is a nice uh, illustration of um, how uh, the simplest kind of liquid crystal display could function. Right? Here is a sample of liquid crystals that is uh, confined between surfaces that are aligning it uh, uh, sideways uh, on the top and in and out the plane of the board. Uh, on the bottom, okay? So, if polarized light is shining through here, the polarization just gets rotated by the molecular orientation, and it can pass through uh, a perpendicular polarizing filter, and you can see light getting through. By comparison, if you put a voltage on, um, then um, the voltage uh, makes the molecules rotate. They now align this way, so they are no longer effective in rotating the polarization of light. So now the light gets blocked as it passes through this series of polarizing filters, and the image looks dark. So that's what would go into a calculator uh, up here, right? Here's a calculator or a digital watch. Um, and um, each of the uh, seven elements uh, making up this number eight, right, is one of these liquid crystal units, and as you put a voltage on, it gets dark, and when you take the voltage off, it gets light, okay? So by switching the voltage applied to each of these seven pieces, Right? You can make the number uh, change from an eight to well, whatever you want. Um, so that's the, the simplest version of how a liquid crystal display could function, how we want to use the balance of energy and entropy to control the arrangement of the molecules. <coughs> so for liquid crystals in practice, you know, I showed you the simplest version uh, to make a digital watch or a calculator. Now, of course, liquid crystals are everywhere, right, in the displays for cell phones, TVs, laptops, digital cameras. Um, notice, by the way, that we are in the Samsung Auditorium, and I've shown entirely Samsung products uh, up here. I know where my bread is buttered. Um, so, um, yeah, so liquid crystals in practice. All right, but this now brings me to uh, liquid crystal and elastomers, and really to the theme of this lecture and the theme of the conference that's taking place uh, here at Kent State. The goal of this international group of scientists gathered here is to combine the features of liquid crystals with the features of elastomers to build a new class of materials. So, the goal is to take from liquid crystals, the orientational order, right, the special direction that molecules are pointing. Um, hence, the sensitivity to all these different things, electric fields, magnetic
magnetic fields, surface treatments, and so forth. Also, from liquid crystals, we want the feature that there's an abrupt phase transition under a temperature change. Right? If you make a small change in the temperature, you will get a very sudden response of the material. Um, and we like the feature that liquid crystals interact with light, right? so that we can use light to control them as input, or we can get an optical output uh, coming out from the materials. From elastomers, we want the mechanical properties. Right, the fact that uh, elastomers are sensitive to applied stretches, uh, stresses that you can push or pull on them, uh, and that they respond, that they have mechanical output as well. They produce mechanical uh, distortions, right, getting longer or shorter. Okay, so uh, we want to combine these features together into a single material liquid crystalline elastomer, um, more or less as shown here. Right here, we see uh, a, a, a network of polymer chains, which are connected by crosslinks, right? So the polymer chains are red, the crosslinks are green. Um, but in so that much is like an elastomer. But in addition to that, there are liquid crystalline groups uh, attached to uh, the polymers, um, and that's these oval groups uh, which are connected to the polymers uh, by other chemical bonds. And these liquid crystalline groups uh, could be in a nomadic phase, right? Here on this side of the picture, they are on average pointing in one direction sideways, or they could be in an isotropic phase, as seen over on that side of the figure, uh, where they are pointing in all random directions. Okay, so now, when you have the liquid crystalline groups um, uh, uh, bonded to the polymer, immersed in the polymer, when the liquid crystals change their distribution of orientations, that affects the polymer. If the liquid crystals are all oriented in the same direction, it makes the polymer want to stretch out. Right? So the entire system, the rubber band, would be extended in some direction. On the other hand, if the liquid crystals are pointing in random directions, they no longer do that. Right? So then the polymer has, no longer has any tendency to stretch out. It wants to contract again. So you get a situation where you can switch back and forth between these uh, uh, mechanical configurations um, by controlling what the liquid crystal is doing, by changing the temperature uh, or shining ultraviolet light on the material or putting on an electric field. So you can have the liquid crystal controlling the polymer. Conversely, uh, it, you know, the physical effects work both ways. If you pull on the polymer, the polymer is extended, that now creates uh, a special environment for the liquid crystal. It's an environment for the liquid crystal that is no longer symmetrical. It now has some special direction. And so the liquid crystal molecules will tend to want to line up in that direction hence changing the way that light passes through the material, right? So it's an effect that goes both ways. You can put in one of these inputs, temperature, uh, electric field, and so forth, and get a mechanical output, or vice versa. You can put in a mechanical input and get uh, an optical output coming from these materials. And so it gives the possibility for new kinds of physical couplings that haven't been available to us before. So here I have uh, a few uh, videos that I've uh, gathered from uh, different people's uh, experiments. Um, here's one case where we have a temperature change uh, leading to an extension or contraction. So this is a coil of wire, right? That's what you see winding around there. 
Um, and if you run electricity through the wire, right, it heats up like a toaster. Um, and um, then here is the uh, elastomer sample running right through there. Right? If it gets hotter, it goes into an isotropic phase and contracts. If you turn off the electricity, then the elastomer gets uh, colder, goes back into its pneumatic phase, uh, and extends. So you can see the elastomer sort of pumping iron um, here uh, as it uh, extends and contracts. Right? So this is a way to try to build the elastomer as what people call an artificial muscle. Right? That is a, a fiber that could do the job of a muscle inside of some robotic system. Um, here's another example where the elastomer has been doped with a dye uh, that is sensitive to ultraviolet light, and then people shine ultraviolet light on it from above, um, and that uh, changes the distribution of liquid crystal orientations uh, and hence changes the shape in this uh, uh, anisotropic way, and hence leads to the, the curvature or straightening of the, uh, of the film. Um, one of my uh, colleagues at Kent State uh, has uh, done experiments where he's made an elastomer film uh, sensitive to ultraviolet light like that, um, that is uh, more or less in the shape of a potato chip, right, that now floats on the surface of water. Um, and then he can shine uh, ultraviolet light uh, onto it, and it changes its shape like this, and that change of shape um, pushes the water away, and hence the elastomer film uh, uh, swims away from where the light is shining on it. So uh, it's an uh, elastomer swimmer that likes to swim into the dark. Uh, out of the light that, uh, that shines on it uh, from above. Um, uh, here's another uh, example, um, also from the, uh, the Paul Feig lab at Kent State, um, where uh, people work with a cholesteric uh, elastomer. <laughs> a cholesteric is a version of the liquid crystal phase uh, where the orientation is twisted up with a particular wavelength. And if you shine light on it, it reflects the color that corresponds to the twist. Right? So here, in this case, if you pull on the elastomer, um, you stretch out the twist of the molecules, and hence you change the color that you get. So just by pulling, this material changes color. Um, the lab can also... Um, turn uh, this kind of elastomer into uh, a laser based on the uh, periodicity of the molecular orientation inside, and this can make a laser that is changing color as you pull on it. So it's an example of putting a mechanical input in uh, by uh, pulling the corners uh, apart over here, together over here, and getting out the, op the optical output, the uh, color change. Um, and another example over here from the uh, Naval Research Lab, where I used to work before I came to Kent State, uh, an elastomer that's been prepared with uh, uh, flexible electrodes on the two sides. And in this case, by putting on uh, an alternating uh, electric field, on the two sides, right? So that there's a voltage either pointing this way or pointing the other way. Uh, it can make the whole elastomer uh, twist uh, back and forth. So um, a different way of uh, now putting an electrical input in and getting this uh, twisting shape change uh, as the output coming back. So another way that we could build an actuator, uh, perhaps a valve that could open and close, uh, coming from this uh, elastomer structure. So um, at this point, I'm, uh, I'm about out of time. So let me just uh, wrap up by uh, summarizing the main messages that I'm trying to get across through this presentation. All right, but there's a delicate balance between energy and entropy 
that controls the physics of many materials, uh, including these examples, polymers, elastomers, uh, liquid crystals, uh, that have so much changed our lives through the 20th century. And that by understanding this balance, really by thinking about the fundamental physics that's involved, uh, we can design new materials, uh, in particular the liquid crystal and elastomers that are the subject of this uh, international conference, uh, new materials that have new couplings uh, between temperature, electric field, optical stimuli, and mechanical response, um, which we believe have a great potential for technology coming up in the 21st century. So with that, I'll close, and I thank you very much. Thank you, Jonathan, for a very nice talk, uh, very general ideas. I think there's a lot one can take away to one's teaching. Um, especially of uh, undergraduates who are not science majors, just from uh, a talk which basically led to a very specific uh, topic in the end, um, and an interesting one. We have plenty of time for questions, uh, at least 10 minutes here, so does anyone have a question? Yes, please. So thank you for the beautiful lecture and beautiful talk of the Greek open. So you made me think that that uh, you can use physics not only to understand poetry, but also art. So in Philadelphia, the International Literature of Philadelphia, there is a beautiful work of art, which is a wall. And the bricks of this wall are made of cubes. And they are white cotton cubes, each plated by the artist's bread. So and that's a large-scale version of the experiment you showed us. And you made me think that uh, you made us understand that it's entropy that keeps uh, art in place. <laughs> well, it goes to show I'd rather be in Philadelphia. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's, that's great. That's a nice uh, example. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, I think I've overwhelmed them all. Oh, oh please. Yeah, yeah. Um, what kind of uh, mechanical forces Well, it, it depends on the dimensions of the of the elastomer. Um, I think you're you're starting to get into a technical subject that's maybe more the province of the rest of this conference rather than um, specifically my talk. Um, but let me just say in general that the, the properties you know, per size are comparable to natural muscles. Um, and so uh, you know, that's, that's the, the comparison that I can make here. Um, beyond that, I think it's a little beyond the scope of